Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Andy Lyon. I'm a public information officer with Pacific Northwest Team 2 here with an update on the Cameron Peak Fire and the Thompson Zone of the uh, East Troublesome Fire. Now, our numbers haven't changed. We're still showing the same containment numbers we have for the past several days, but don't let that fool you. The fire has not moved. There has been some uh, additional smoke with the wind. There is stuff still burning out there in the snow, but it's mostly surrounded by snow. We're going to have an update from our operations uh, section, Chief Kyle Cannon, here in just a moment. Um, and I know it's a big fire and that we haven't talked about individual areas. We haven't talked much about the north, Red Feather Lakes, Crystal Lakes. Uh, that's because nothing's been happening up there fire-wise, but there's still lots of people up there, you know, keeping an eye on things. So just because we haven't mentioned your specific area doesn't mean that there's not lots of eyes on uh, every bit of this fire, because there are. There are hundreds of firefighters still on the fire, and that is one of the reasons we're um, looking forward to kind of a warming trend this week, because that allows the roads to dry out, that allows us better access, so we can get in there and do the work that needs to be done before we can call this thing done. So we have, while we have these people, while we have good weather, while the fire, what's left of it is showing itself, now is the time for us to get in there and do some of that work before winter so you don't have to worry about this. That doesn't mean that you won't see smoke coming off some of these things for weeks, if not months, because fire has a way of persisting, especially in areas uh, that haven't burned before or where there's lots of big logs down there. So um, that's just kind of an overview. Let's, uh, we had some good news yesterday. Larimer County did reduce uh, evacuation levels for one area, uh, and your source for evacuation news is the Larimer County Joint Information Center, and that number is listed in the introduction to this post and everywhere else. So. Um, Hopefully, you know, that's good news for folks. We want to get you back into your homes, uh, but we want to do it safely. So with that, let me introduce uh, Kyle Cannon, one of our operations section chiefs, who will tell you a little bit more about what's going on. Kyle? Yeah, good morning, Kyle Cannon, operations with PNW2. As uh, Andy mentioned, you know, the warmer and drier sunny days have been really helpful with not only getting us uh, access into um, for the fire line areas, but also that helps dry out the fuels. And overall, that helps us know better where we can focus our energies. People, we're beginning to see more smoke in, in places, and those are the places then that we're going to go focus our energies and try to make sure that that uh, fire's edge gets secure and uh, we don't have any further fire spread towards um, towards town or towards the places of the, the values that we're concerned about. So with that in, my, in mind, I'll go around the fire here real quick. Starting in Branch 1 in Division Delta on the north end of the fire, uh, we chased down that smoke in Bellevue a couple of days ago. We also, as Andy mentioned, have people out looking all through the area, opening roads, using plow trucks and graders to try to get access to not only uh, start the repair work of all these dozer lines, but also begin to look at some of these little areas that uh, before the snow we had, uh, they were not called contained. We were able to get in and do a few yesterday in, in the north end. We're continuing with that to try to make sure that all those areas are secured before we, uh, before we move on. Uh, coming down into branch two on the east side of the fire, uh, yesterday we were able to call along Buckhorn Secure. We had folks in there mopping up for a couple of days, picked up all the smokes that were any threat to the line, we're calling that, as well as this uh, little piece over here in Buckhorn Creek by Elk Creek uh, that we had. That's called contained today as well. So we're making good progress in there. And from now, and for the most part, along that uh, eastern edge along Buckhorn, we'll be in uh, repair status, trying to get equipment back hauled and thawed out and out of there as well as start that repair. Uh, coming around on to the south side of uh, Cameron Peak Fire, uh, we still have some areas around Gallucci Dip and, the, and Storm Mountain that we're working on. We have folks in there today uh, out on the fire line trying to mop those areas up and get them secured as well as around the retreat. 
and then moving over towards uh, Glen Haven and the slop over the North Fork. You know, there's still some heat in there. Our, uh, our infrared mapping shows that there is heat along there. Uh, we're monitoring that, working up plans not only to get people in there if needed, uh, but maybe perhaps use aerial assets as well and some indirect in case uh, there's a need for that as well. So we got some plans going. Uh, moving farther west over into Pingree, this area right in here um, by the CSU campus is showing the most smoke. Uh, yesterday with that wind event, however, the good news is it really didn't move much at all. Um, so I think for the most part, that's in pretty good shape. There's good snow in there, but we do have plans in place in case we need them in that area as well. We'll be using uh, drone um, uh, technology to come out and take a look at this today. That's the plan to see if, that, uh, if there's any heat left in that upper area as well. And then coming down into the uh, Thompson zone, we have folks, um, crews out direct on the lines on both sides, both north and south, starting here, working their way this direction, securing that line, as well as uh, you know, uh, preparing those indirect lines if needed. So good, ma making good progress across the entire fire. Kyle, we had one question, uh, and that is, how do we determine when a fire is out? And maybe just talk a little bit about contained, controlled. Right. Out. You know, so this size of a fire, it's it's a long duration issue to actually call a fire out. You know, we're slowly working at trying to contain um, these areas, and containment really is a factor of not only. Uh, having a control line in, but our confidence that that control line will hold. And once we feel very confident that line will not um, allow fire to come out, we'll call it contained. A fire then turns controlled when it's not only con entirely contained, but we're 99.9% .9 sure that that will not come out and we call it controlled. Out will probably be sometime this winter when the, when the park and the forest and the county uh, and the state all feel like there's no heat left in that fire. And that could be a ways into winter, perhaps, depending on the, on the weather systems. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, we also asked uh, our fire behavior analyst, uh, Katie Hetz, to come in and uh, talk a little bit. We talked for a few days about, you know, the wind was going to show us where the fire was, and uh, so uh, we asked her to come in and talk about what did the wind show us. So c come on in here, Katie. Hi, good morning. Katie Hetz, Fire Behavior Analyst, as promised. And um, as Andy has already mentioned, the dry cold front uh, yesterday that increased our winds with gusts up to 50 miles per hour, especially from the west, um, really enhanced our ability to get our jobs done, ultimately. Um, I think I want to talk a little more broadly initially before I walk around the fire about why, let's say, uh, increased wind gusts that came yesterday were quite a bit different than strong west wind events that moved the fire through the course of the life of this fire. And ultimately, that has to do with a measure of seasonality or fuel dryness that we have. Uh, we call it ERCs. That stands for energy release component, and that ultimately is a measure of large diameter fuel dryness. So when um, this fire took a number of runs, you know, beginning in August and then another one in September, another one in October, that uh, level of ERCs, the levels of ERCs, of fuel dryness, seasonality, was setting historic highs in most cases, and if not historic highs, above the 97th percentile for dryness. So this is an indication of long-term drought that was really in place before this, this fire got started. So differently, yesterday what we had, um, those values of ERCs, fuel dryness, when the wind event came yesterday, were only at the 50th percentile. There was maybe one uh, area where it was at the 60th percentile, but nothing like what moved these fires uh, it previously. So I wanted to answer some of those questions that I hear coming in about, well, what's the difference now? So that's, that's a big difference in what we have going on. Um, additionally, the, the wind event, if you will, was not as long and not as strong. So that, that was a variable as well. Not to mention a very large snow event prior to the wind event. So you know, some of these areas, I think, got as much as 18, 20 inches of snow. 
So now let me walk around the fire a little bit and tell you, you know, what I'm seeing, which is no different than what Kyle said and what Andy said, and we're, we're all really, I think, ultimately on the same page here about what we have out there now and what we may have going forward into the next week. So um, as far as I go, I went, I can't, I'm not even tall enough to point where I went. I went to the very north end of the fire yesterday to uh, reset up or uh, it had tipped over or something we call a ROS, a remote automated weather station. So we got that upright so that the, the wind values and the wind direction could be um, more accurate, obviously. And if I may say, up there on the north end of the fire, I think there's something, a feature up there called Dead Man Hill, Dead Man Road. It's called the Dead Man Ross. It is, it is pretty wintry up there at 10,000 feet. So that, I think, speaks to the fact that the whole northwest corner of this fire is well contained. And certainly, Kyle already mentioned the various places along the west side and north side that if if there's anything out there at all, they're on it. Um, so let's move around a little bit to um, currently what has shown. And as Kyle mentioned, there's a little bit of heat here in this uh, retreat, Cedar Park. I think it's called Gallucci Dip. That area, section 29 in there, has a little bit of heat in it. This North Fork slopover here, North Fork Trail slopover, that has some heat in it. And then uh, the uh, area in the Structure Pingree Group near the um, CSU campus, there's some heat there. So that's what I want to talk about with, uh, th that's what I want to mention on the Cameron Peak Fire as far as heat goes. And then um, I'm just going to mentioned briefly the Thompson zone of the East Troublesome, and then I'm going to try and wrap up with some more broad statements about what we may see moving forward. So down here in Division Zulu and Division Whiskey, that's the, east, that's the Thompson zone of the um, East Troublesome fire, and there is some heat there also on the south end, and um, not a lot of heat or smoke showing on the north end. Um, so, in these areas of heat, what, way, what may we see going forward and what sort of fire behavior may be exhibited? So, um, that's a little bit variable and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, consistent with variable fuels and variable snow load and also aspect. So, south facing aspects are drying out quicker and have less snow on them and if exposed to wind and there's still some um, remnant heat in there, those will probably be indicated and people will be able to get to those fairly quickly. It will take a longer time for um, fire on north facing slopes to show itself uh, because of the snow load on the north facing aspects. Um, more broadly moving forward, we do continue to warm and dry with our probably peak warmest driest day tomorrow, Tuesday. That said, um, when it's most warm and dry, as far as temperatures and relative humidities, um, the, the winds will not be as strong. So those uh, variables work to sort of counterbalance each other, if you will, going forward. Um, fire behavior-wise, I think, um, while extremely minimal, I think we, it's in different sort of fuel types, so it will be different. Down here in Division Zulu, there's some... Um, heat showing in the duff. So it's just in like the ground fuels, the surface fuels down on the ground for the most part. Here in the North Fork slopover, the smokes that you're seeing are established in heavy fuels, dead and down logs, lots of bug kill in, in that area. And so as Kyle was mentioning, those smokes may be with us for a while. Um, most of that heat is interior. I think in areas that show heat in dead and down logs, heavy fuels, the, the, on, the only escalated fire behavior that might be possible, and I think it's extremely limited, but I, I do want to mention it, so if it does happen, no one is taken by surprise, is that if there's enough heat in the heavy fuels under a continuous canopy 
of conifers, and those vertical fuels, the ladder fuels as we call them, reach to the ground and the heat is under the ladder fuels, especially in areas of uh, bug kill. So, you know, there's dry needles potentially still out there that we could see something called single tree torching, where one tree, maybe two trees torch. But I don't see uh, coming up any, let's say, group torching that with a wind that would produce any sort of crown fire, which is the sort of main vector that has moved this fire um, throughout the life of the fire. And I think that is ultimately what I would like to close with as my message. And I'm not sure if there's questions or we're ready for the next. We, oh, do, yes. we do have a question, Katie, and that is how do we measure uh, ERC? How do we measure ERC? Okay, I don't want to get too jargony. It has to do with time lag fuel moisture. And we consider those to be 1,000-hour fuels. So it takes 1,000 hours for something greater than three inches in diameter to um, regain two-thirds of its moisture. And I think that's as jargon as, as I would like to be with that. But a 1,000 hours is um, a very long time. What is that, like 30 days, 60 days maybe? So that's why we consider it a measure of seasonal fuel dryness. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Okay, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up uh, just with a reminder that we've been doing these for six days now, and uh, we are planning to do another. Kale will be back in the morning. We've asked uh, Captain Shellhammer from the Larimer County Sheriff's Office to join us and talk about uh, evacuation statuses and, and whatever else, and if he is able to uh, be here if other law enforcement duties don't get in his way, then uh, you'll hear from him tomorrow morning. And then we're going to evaluate the need for this kind of uh, live update. We're not going to stop doing the traditional uh, written updates. We're going to keep updating the Facebook page and, and keep updating uh, NCWeb. But uh, we need to assess whether this kind of effort is, is something that's needed. If it is needed, we're going to continue to do it. And if it's not, we will we'll stop. Um, and uh, just a reminder again, we're also planning another uh, live virtual public meeting for tomorrow evening. So that's going to do it for us from the Cameron Peak Fire and the uh, Thompson Zone of East Troublesome. Thank you very much for watching.